Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how you go forward in this program. Um, you know, when you go to the SEAL training, you, you are not going to be doing a five-mile swim the first day. The, the process is very stair-stepped. So when you begin to build your plan, when you look at your, at your, um, at your purpose in life and you, and you begin, to, begin to build this training mission and training plan, I think maybe some of you have done that already, you don't want to have like nine new rituals you're going to start tomorrow. I mean, it's like you don't send kids to do a five-mile swim the first day. You, you do a stair-step. You build these things slowly and deliberately. Rituals are hard to build, I can assure you, and they're hard to break, too, and I'll try to tell you about that. Uh, but again, you know, we're, we're, that's how we do this thing. So we build, the, build their capacity, and if you ask a kid in the ninth week of training what fourth week is like, let's say, you'll say, well, God, it was awful when I did it. But now that I'm in the ninth week, it really isn't that bad because he's already gone past that. And that's what you're doing with a ritual, the building that habit. Pretty soon, you raise your whole level of ability and, and, and capacity to do work to a point where you can't believe. But you can't just turn it on one day. And, and as Jim will tell you, it takes, takes a while to build, build these habits and rituals. So probably, I think, about three months. We test multidimensional stress. Now, I don't know about you, but nobody I ever had work for me ever came to work and was able to turn off everything in their life to work for eight or ten hours. We live in a, and we live in a world where there's stresses coming at you all directions. You've got a, you've got a child with chicken pox. You're going to be wor thinking about that child when you're at work, and that's just how life is. Well, in the SEALs, that's what we teach, multidimensional stress. We expose them to it. We'll put the kids in a pool, and you'll see in the film, you have to tie knots underwater. It's not a big deal. But there's two dimensions here, right? One, you've got to hold your breath, and two, you've got to think about how that knot gets tied. And they all get that right away, but then we blindfold them. Ah, there's another problem there now. Now they've got to think. They've got to be able to hold their breath, and they can't see. And if they can't stay calm because they can't see, they come to the surface and they fail. Now, eventually, they all get that. But the whole point is that's what we do in SEALs. We understand the fact that all of, I understand the fact that all of you, and in the case of the SEALs, deal in a life of multiple dimensions of stress. And our stress, we're talking about going to war, where you have things coming at you from all directions. But your, your, your life is no less important than theirs. You have, you have stress coming at you, and how do you deal with it? And, it, and it's hard to deal with it by doing push-ups, okay? You can be the best person in the world doing push-ups. You're not going to solve some of those problems. There's, there are much better ways to do that, and it's in, emo in, in, in handling your emotional energy and your mental energy, and, of course, at the very top, your spiritual energy. It was a mile-and-a-half swim. It wasn't a long swim, um, but it was big surf. It took us 20 minutes to get through the surf. It was after lunch. And everybody got sick, drinking salt water and throwing up, and we had to do three half-mile three half mile legs. And I had a swim buddy. You saw, you have, they call them swim buddies. And my swim buddy was a 19-year-old from Michigan, high school graduate, never been in the ocean before. And I was 26, married, and had two kids, Annapolis graduate, pretty good athlete, um, and grew up in California around the ocean. So we get to the mile point, got a half mile to go, turn around, and the kid's name was Jim Lampman. I says, Jim, I said, I'm not sure I'm going to make the last half mile. Now, you saw the fins we have we swim with. And you don't swim freestyle and see those, you know, the enemy can see you when your arms come out. So you just keep your arms underwater and you kick these fins. He said, ah, oh, sir, just roll over on your back. Roll over on your back, and I'll talk you back the last half mile. And we made it. We made it. And the point I'm making there is that no matter who you are, there's a point in your life where you're vulnerable, right? You're vulnerable. Everybody is the strongest guys, the strongest ladies. There's always a point in your life where you have a way to call on. If you don't have a team around you, then you're, you know, your own worst enemy because at the right time, that young, eight, 19 year old seaman, high school graduate from Michigan, helped out a grown guy, athlete, college, all this stuff, and I needed him, and he helped me. And that's what you do when you build your team. You do the same thing. You can't, you know, you can't, uh, I was talking to Dana this morning. I said, you know, I was an animal. I could give orders to anybody. In, in the military, everybody salutes. I said, but that's not how life works with the team. I said, unilateralism, some guy said once, produces an outcome, but it doesn't necessarily produce a solution. I can make outcomes. Anybody can make an outcome, but is it a solution? Remember in Chemistry 101, right? What a solution is? It's a solvent sitting in a big, big vial, and then you add a solute to it. Well, you're the solvent if you're a leader, and the, and the solute is what goes in to make the solution. Can't, you can't make it otherwise. We have a four-mile run. It's a time run. And you tell the kids, okay, you're going to um, run four miles, and the faster you run it, the more points you get. But we have one other part of this thing. Before you start, you're going to have two minutes to look at a board with all these little things on it. Wristwatch, uh, wallet, common things, and a couple things that are a little esoteric. And you've got to memorize those. Because when you get back after the four-mile run, you have to write them down. 
right? You've got to write them down. And the more you get, the more points you get. So you decide what you're going to do, right? So off they go. And half of them will run as fast as they can. And they get to the end, and they can write three things down because they're running so hard they couldn't keep them in my mind. But the smart guys figure out there's a more important way to do this. Slow down a little bit, right? Slow the physical part of the exertion down, and you can, you can, you can produce a product. If you're working in a company, you just got a task to do, and two of your partners are doing the same thing. If you're the first person there, but you haven't delivered the goods, it doesn't matter. The time element is not what you want to deal with. It's the energy element, right? We're back to the same old thing here. It's the energy. You know, it's, don't get caught in your life, and it's so hard to do, with measuring a project based upon time. And sometimes it has to happen that way. It does. This is the way life is. But try to think about working at a level where you, you, you can bring together all your energy, your mental focus, your emotional response, and your physical as necessary. So how important is energy management, physical energy management? Well, I deployed to Desert Storm right away. All my guys, we were, we were in, uh, we arrived in, uh, Saudi Arabia on my anniversary. My wife never lets me forget that. And, uh, so, uh, we had 300 guys. We had an isolated base. We didn't have any food. So, to set the stage, we, every day we'd have to drive 15 miles one way and back to get our meals. So, right away we had people up on the, uh, the Kuwaiti border and doing all kinds of stuff, training. And so I had a staff meeting at 7.30 in the morning. Not have one at 7.30 at night. So I get up at 4 o'clock, 4.30, because I have to read all the messages, to do all my answers back to the Schwarzkopf staff or anybody else. And so I get up, read them, drinking coffee, right? Good Davy man, knocking down a few cups of coffee. And then I, it's time for me to go on my run, because i got to stay physically fit. Now, it's like 100, well, it wasn't 110 in the, in the middle of the night at 4 in the morning, but it was in the 90s. If you ever lived in the East Coast and went for a run, you know you sweat for half an hour after you run. You never stop sweating. So I go off four or six miles, get back, and uh, times the clock's running, so it's time to take a shower and go into the staff meeting. So let's, let's think about what I had just done to myself. I, had, I was already sleep deprived because we're working long hours. Got up early, mainlined a bunch of caffeine. Okay, I'm, blood sugar is low when you wake up anyway. I'm sure, sure she told you about that. And now I haven't had anything to eat, just coffee. And now I go for a six mile run. I've got a diuretic in my system, already making me, making me lose water, and now I'm sweating out that, and now I walk into my staff meeting. Boy, huh? Am I fully engaged? Man, I, and so it was funny, but this is a true story, and I didn't even think about it until I met Jim Lair. So I knew enough to know this was not good because I was just, there's a word for what I was in my staff meetings. But I'll just suffice to say that if you could have the greatest idea in the world, and I'd find something wrong with it. That's just how I was, and I'm not that kind of person. At night, 7.30 meeting, back to, be, back to battery, so to speak, and you get a dumb side down, I'd like it, because it was all about what I had done to myself physically. Strong, extremely, extremely low blood sugar, totally dehydrated, sleep deprived, and I'm going to be, one, a good judge of good ideas, and two, not be cantankerous? No way. There's no way. Jim and I were giving a speech to a company, or a company up in Chicago, top 150 uh, executives. Half of them don't even eat breakfast. I mean, you, you can't, probably you can't do anything worse for yourself than not eat breakfast, even if it's a bar, anything to put your blood sugar back to where it's at. So uh, I never thought about it anymore until I met Jim, and I was already in one of these classes, and he was talking about all this stuff, and I realized that's what happened to me. That's what happened to me, that I hadn't paid, paid, paid attention to that. You know why? Because I was managing time, right? My time was right, no problem. Got everything done, walked in 7.30, great time manager, but I couldn't deliver the goods when I got in there. I forgot to tell you about um, normalizing the abnormal. I didn't tell you about the mud, did I? You know, I see that mud in the film. And these guys live in that mud. It's just awful mud. It's, it's full, of, full of seashells and methane gas, and, and they roll around this stuff. You saw them. And they never could figure out why. So I always tell each class, there's a reason why we do that. And, and of course, you're not going to send a SEAL guys out on an operation of mud, but they roll around it really racist. I said, the reason is there's something really great about mud. And now they're really... They're really, I've captured them. I said, the great thing about mud is you can wash it off. How much mud do you have in your life you can wash off? I mean, well, I have it. And they realize that, yeah, mud's mud. It's, it's, it's lousy, but you can wash it off and it goes away. As soon as it's washed off, you don't have it anymore. So that's what Jim talks about. Find the things that are most important and put your energy on those. Stay away from the mud. He doesn't say it that way, but that's why I'm saying it. You stay away from the mud and wash that off. Don't spend any energy on it. Get a hose and wash it off, so to speak. And that's, that's what we teach them for. There's, there's no other reason for it. You're never going to have an operation 
in mud. That's not how it works. Um, but at the end, you know, uh, movement's a big deal. I know we talked about movement. Um, my son Adam, the other CEO, was a, to go to sniper school, and he. Uh, this is how this is how hard movement is for us in our lives. You know, the body's meant to move. It's not meant to not move. And the more you move, the more it loves you. I mean, it's talking to you, saying, thanks a lot, Joe. Man, that's just great. Loved it. You may not be thinking so, but the body is. And uh, he said, you know, sniper school is really tough. And I was thinking about the shooting. He said, no, it's not the shooting. He said, it's a stealth and concealment. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they'll put you out in the desert, and you've got maybe six hours to move 200 yards to get to a position where you would take a shot. He said, it's almost impossible to do. There are guys who fail it because they can't stay stationary because the body wants to move. It doesn't want to move a half inch at a time over six hours. It's a powerful message about it. Your body wants to move, whether you're a sniper or not. He wants you to move. And, and so movement is important. 